And I can't think of a better way to introduce our keynote for today because when you're trying new things, when you're designing, sometimes you fail, but if you fail fast and learn fast, you get forward a whole lot faster. And so I want to bring to the stage John Spencer, who I first met, well, we first saw you last year, and I heard you talk about your experience as a middle school student, and my first thought was, oh my gosh, this is something I can relate to, and I think you're gonna find the same thing. And he is really going to take us, he's gonna launch us into, no pun intended or pun intended, launch us into how we should be thinking about design and his experience with that and how it can lead you into innovation with your students. So John, would you join us up here? And a little bit about me ahead of time. Um, here's where you can follow me. I'm on Twitter, at Spencer Ideas. I have a YouTube channel. It's uh, spencervideos.com. And I blog pretty regularly um, at spencerauthor.com. Um, and then my email is john at spencerauthor.com. So if you want to connect afterwards, this is how you can follow me. Okay. Um, here's where you can't follow me. So. Just putting it out there. There's some uh, setting some boundaries ahead of time. Make sure we're good. Um, I do, like I said, I have a YouTube channel, um, and I love to make these uh, sketch videos. And you'll you'll see a little bit about that here in, in a little bit. Quick disclaimer before I get started. Um, I'm still learning this stuff. I'm still figuring it out. I'm still on a journey. Um, I've been teaching uh, at the university level for a little over two years. And before that, I taught for about 12 years uh, in the middle school. And although I had projects that were you know, fun and awesome and went well, um, I also had projects that straight up tanked. And we had to stop because it just was like, uh, punt the ball, let the other team have it. We're going to move on. Right? Um, I had cringeworthy moments as an eighth grade teacher where I you know, shamed a student or yelled at a class. Um, I wasn't perfect. And so um, when I think about what I've learned, I actually have these um, Venn diagrams to kind of show you. Um, everything I've learned is either from making mistakes, from experimenting and trying things out, and from taking the best ideas from the colleagues I worked with. And so as I share what I'm sharing here, please, in the background, understand that so much of what I've learned has been from, from working with amazing teachers who did a thankless job day in and day out. So with that in mind, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own experience first. I was born in the Ice Age. at a time when this bad boy was considered cutting edge. And my biggest concern with technology was making it through the Oregon Trail without dying of dysentery. <laughs> By the way, I moved from Arizona to Oregon about two years ago when I, when I moved to the college. And uh, I was really disappointed. Like, nobody has dysentery there. It's just, I think it's been eradicated or something. Felt like hearing that Santa wasn't real. I was like, oh, it's just hipsters and craft beer. Um, it's totally not what I thought it would be. And Oregon's a weird state. Did you know in Oregon, it's illegal to pump your own gasoline? You cannot pump your gas. But smoking pot's totally legal. <laughs> it's the weirdest state around. So. That's where I live. I don't smoke pot, by the way. I just want to be very clear. I work for a Christian college. I could not get away with that. And I wouldn't. It's bad for you. Um, I already stress eat. I wouldn't need anything else uh, making me hungry. So this was me in the eighth grade. And although I seemed like a pretty good student, I was a straight B student. Um, I was quiet. My goal in school was basically to be uh, invisible. Sorry. And I was incredibly nerdy and incredibly shy. 
I remember a moment when uh, in eighth grade, I had one friend, and his name was Matt. He was a kid I knew from church. And he had perfect attendance. He was my one friend. We were two nerds in a pod. We liked Star Trek. We liked um, to geek out on classic rock and would talk about history. And we were just two nerds who would hang out every single day at lunch. And I remember the day that um, he was gone from school. And I remember standing there with my cafeteria tray and looking out on the sea of students all around and just waiting there with this tray, hoping that somebody would invite me to their table. And it didn't happen. <coughs> my goal of being invisible had worked. I threw my tray away. I hid out in the boys' bathroom which is the worst place to hang out, by the way. If you've ever been in an eighth grade boys' restroom, it's like, aim should be a 21st century skill. And, <laughs> and because of that, I had accomplished my goal, and I realized that it is not fun to not be known, that it's actually really lonely, and that the best parts of who I was as a person was something I had completely kept hidden my nerdiness, my creativity, any of those things. And so fortunately for me, I had a teacher who refused to let me be invisible. Her name was Mrs. Smoot. And she said, I know you love baseball, and I know you care about social justice, so I want you to do a, a project called a History Day project. And I want you to do something really uncomfortable. In the end, I want you to present it to our class. And if you're comfortable with that, then you can go to the district competition. And so for the first time ever, I got to own my learning. It was truly personalized, not based on a computer program, but based upon my own personal interests. I got to interview former Major League Baseball players. I got to interview former Negro League players. I did the integration of baseball, the story of Jackie Robinson. And through this process, I learned so much about the world, about history. But also, I learned how to manage projects, how to revise my work, how to study hard. I mean, there were so many skills I learned through this project. But there was a, a part toward the end where I was recording the audio for my script to present in front of the class. We went to a radio studio. And I heard my voice for the first time. And like most middle school kids, I hated the way my voice sounded. And I looked at Mrs. Smoot and I said, I am not going to do this. this. I am not going to be part of this presentation. I'm done. I'm finished. I quit. And she said something that stuck with me forever. She said, when you hide your voice from the world, you rob the world of your creativity. And I'm not going to let you do that. And so I finished this slide presentation. I got in front of the class a couple weeks later, and I presented it. And I remember there was this one boy he was a football player, and he did that like 1980s slow clap that you see in those movies. And then other kids clapped. And I was so insecure that I thought at first he was mocking me. And then I realized, no, I had presented something good. And by launching it to an audience, I had gained confidence in my creative abilities. It was suddenly real. So I went ahead and I went to the district competition. I got to go to the state competition. And then I eventually went to Washington, DC and got to present nationally. And that shaped everything I believe about education, everything I believe about uh, what it means to own your learning. This whole idea that you need to engage in the creative process. This idea that you need to develop a maker mindset. I have three kids, and every day I ask them this question, what did you make today? And there have been years where I would ask that question, and they, they would say, 
I, we, we did popcorn reading. I was like, I have no idea what reading popcorn is, but it doesn't sound fun. Um, or they would say, we did packets, or we had worksheets, or I was bored, or I had to wait for everyone to finish so I could move on. But I love the fact that right now, this year, when I ask my kids, what did you make today, they all have an answer. In fact, I don't even have to ask them this question because they run through the door and they are so excited about what they're making. My daughter will say, we're doing cardboard challenges and we had to do this thing where we had to, to, to make a bridge and it was this and it was that. And, and if you've ever seen a, an eight-year-old, they can just talk for an hour without you getting a word in edgewise. And my middle son, Micah, is getting to do Genius Hour. He's doing animation. And my youngest son is in an engineering class that he absolutely loves. And the bottom line for me is it's a reminder that making is magic. And it's magic because it transforms lives. That being creative is important because students will have to uh, engage in a creative economy when they grow up. With the explosion of artificial intelligence, they're going to have to think like entrepreneurs. They're going to have to be innovators. But it goes beyond economics. It's also just the fact that doing creative work is part of what makes life fun. It's part of what makes this world worth living in, is that we get to create new things on a regular basis. It's a deeply human part of who we are. My oldest son, and this picture is a couple years old at this point, loves to um, make his own games. He loves to design his own contraptions. Every year for Christmas and his birthday, instead of asking for like a video game, he asks for um, a, a card for Home Depot, so um, gift card. And so he says, Could you just give me a Home Depot gift card so he can buy PVC pipes or he can buy things for pulleys and things like that. And that's who he is. My middle son loves to draw. He loves to paint. He loves to build worlds in Minecraft. I'm going to show you a quick example just because I'm an obnoxious dad. So bear with me for a second. Here's a little thing he made. Hey, my name is Micah, and I'm doing a sketchy video for my dad. What if you could travel back in time? I mean, like 65 million years ago. What would you bring? A pocket knife for safety? Maybe a flashlight for light? A map for a sense of direction? What would be your main priority? Sit back and enjoy the air on an island with no one to disturb you? Make a shelter in case of rain? What would you want to see? Dinosaurs, ancient rodents, a cool volcano? Would you scavenge for supplies? Would you go beyond the island? Would you make the future even better than it is? It is all up to you to do what you do. I, I just want to point out that he really believed like that the, the, the future would be truly different if you just gave a T-Rex an iPhone 7, as if the T-Rex is going to like you know use it. Its hands are this big, right? It can't even see it. Um, so the bottom line, though, is that they're developing a maker mindset. They're learning to view the world as a builder and a tinkerer, as a problem solver. And that's something that's transferable. That's something that is going to allow them to thrive in the future. One of the things I believe to my core is that classrooms should be bastions of creativity and wonder. And yet the world is changing. We know this. Our devices, I just got a brand new iPhone. I had like an iPhone, I swear, it was like an iPhone 2. It was a giant brick. But I finally got a new iPhone. And our phones that we have used to require a ton of physical stuff, right? If you just look at your home screen, what are some of the things that your devices used to actually require physical things? I'm curious. What do you guys think? Microphone. Microphone. What? Alarm clock, yeah. Radio, camera, all these types of things, right? So we know that our devices have all this creative and connective potential. 
In fact, we were on a road trip last year, and I was like, man, we never fight. I was saying that to my wife, like, we never, ever argue. And that's so awesome. We must have, like, the best marriage ever because our parents argued during road trips all the time. And she was like, yeah, it's because there's no map, right? Like, <laughs> let's be real. Siri has saved our marriage. Like, we, she solves our conflicts for us. We're good. My daughter asked me this question, Dad, were you alive back when people had flip phones? And my father-in-law has a flip phone, and my son was like, Dad, Grandpa Ron's got a burner phone. And I was like, he's not a drug dealer. He's old. There's a difference. So, so the point is we have this connective and creative power. Our devices allow us to make things instantaneously. Just thinking about the creative power, when I made that slide presentation, I know some of you are too young to, to know this, but you used to have to use a physical camera, get the lighting perfect, click on it, wait for the little thing to go there, and then take the picture, and then take this thing called film that was in a roll, take it to Walgreens, get it developed, turn them into slides and just pray that they're not blurry. One of the skills that I have down that nobody needs anymore is how to deal with a jammed slide projector. Like that was something I had to do back then. And now I could do all of that on my device and more. I had to worry when I interviewed those former baseball players, I had to worry about how many minutes I was using up because long distance phone calls used to cost money. So we have this creative and connective power in our devices where kids could easily be makers, and yet that's not what I see. I did a student survey two years ago, and I recently am, am trying to get, uh, just want to double check that I have permission on, on a new survey, but I can tell you I just did a survey of middle schoolers, and the same trend is true. The numbers are no different. And here were the results. Are they consuming or creating with their devices? 158 out of 160 had consumed a video, had watched a video with their phones or their laptops or their tablets. So 158, and two of them were lying because we did not live in Amish country. This was urban Phoenix. Every kid had watched videos on their devices. They all had a device. But only four of them had ever created and edited a video. 159 had listened to audio, but only three of them had actually created it. 152 had played video games, but none of them had done something like Scratch, where they had actually um, created their own games. And if you're listening to this and you're hearing it and you're saying, wait, 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 I do that with my students, then I would say this, you are part of the solution. Please hear what I'm saying, not as a challenge to what you're doing, but as an affirmation for the amazing work that is going on in schools. Because our students don't come from a creative culture. They come from a consumer culture. And these devices, although there's creative and connective potential, they are consumer devices. That's where they're coming from. The bottom line is that students aren't digital natives. We hear that term all the time. They're consumer natives. And why is this the case? Beyond that, in many cases, our students are coming from consumer-driven schools. We have this one-size-fits-all factory model where students passively learn concepts. But kids aren't widgets, and one-size-fits-all is great for socks, but it is a lousy model when thinking about human minds. And so that's that factory system that kids come from, a system built in the 1800s. It's over a century later, but that's the model of education that we still have. And so what do we do about that? The reality is we have outliers. We have those students who are different. I remember one girl that I had, and she had published, she had been in, in the US for three years. She had learned English. And she had published five novels and had over a million page views on Wattpad. And she was a maker. Her name was Laura. 
there was a student named Raul. And he had gone to engineering camp. He, had, he didn't have money for it. They didn't have a scholarship. He was too embarrassed to ask. And so I love this. This shows the power of teachers, right? A teacher in our building silently took care of it. And suddenly, he'd been mowing yards on the side to pay for engineering camp. And suddenly, the, the rest of his engineering money was paid for to go to this camp. He was solving problems. He was fixing things. He was blogging about his experience. He had a maker mindset. And the amazing thing about both of those two students is they didn't develop that maker mindset because they were special or different or gifted. They developed that maker mindset because a teacher cared about them, built a relationship with them, and encouraged them to do something creative with their minds. They have a maker mindset. One of the things I want for, for students is for them to be wildly and unabashedly different. Even at a young age, they can grow into innovators. But that requires us to innovate as teachers in education. So we know the purpose of education, right? If you ask people, what do you want for kids? They'll say, I want them to be democratic citizens. I want them to be critical thinkers. I want them to be prepared for the future economy. Well, if that's the purpose, if that's what we're going for, then they need to have a maker mindset because that's what enables them to do all of the above. And so one thing I want to get into here is how a process called design thinking can help them develop that maker mindset. And the design thinking model I'm going to mention is the one that I helped develop with AJ Giuliani, and it's called the launch cycle. Design thinking is a flexible framework for getting the most out of the creative process. It is used in the arts, in engineering, in the corporate world, and in social and civic spaces. You can use it in every subject with every age group. It works when creating digital content or when building things with duct tape and cardboard. Although there are many models for design thinking, we have developed the student-friendly launch cycle. Here's how it works. In the first phase, students look, listen and learn. The goal here is awareness. It might be a sense of wonder at a process or an awareness of a problem or a sense of empathy toward a group. Sparked by curiosity, students move to the second phase where they ask tons of questions. This leads to understanding the process or problem through an authentic research experience. They might conduct interviews or needs assessments, research articles, watch videos, or analyze data. Students apply the newly acquired knowledge to potential solutions. In this phase, they navigate ideas. Here they not only brainstorm, but they also analyze ideas, combine ideas, and generate a concept for what they will create. In the next phase, they create a prototype. It might be a digital work or a tangible product, a work of art, or something they engineer. It might even be an action or an event or a system. Next, they begin to highlight what's working and fix what's failing. The goal here is to view this revision process as an experiment full of iteration, where every mistake takes them closer and closer to success. Then, when it's done, it's ready to launch. In the launch phase, they send it to an authentic audience. They send their work to the world. And ultimately, that leads back to a place where they can look, listen, and learn. If you're interested in sparking creativity and boosting innovation in your classroom, join us for the Global Day of Design. You can get your free one-day design challenge by clicking the link on this video. So take a day and test it out. See how your students respond to an engaging creative design challenge. All right, so uh, we're going to kind of deconstruct the launch cycle at this point. And real quick, I want to say something about this. This is not the only design thinking framework. And also, design thinking isn't something you use all the time with students. So I want to be clear. When we talk about things that are amazing, sometimes the thing that's amazing is just letting kids choose their own books for a silent reading 
or having kids blog or something like that. So um, I, I don't ever want to pretend that this is a magical formula or a silver bullet or anything like that. So you begin with this first phase of look, listen, and, and learn. And this is the starting place for design thinking. This is where students have a sense of awareness about um, whatever it is they're eventually going to design. And you may start out with a product idea. This was the case when we did our Shark Tank style projects. You guys have seen Shark Tank, right? Okay, cool. Just want to make sure. I watch TV. I know people are always like, I, I'm too busy to watch TV. And I'm like, really? Because I like TV. I think it's great. Um, <laughs> product idea. So uh, something like the Shark Tank style projects would be one of the, the ways to start. Or um, the NaNoWriMo project where kids are um, writing their own novels. Sometimes it's a natural phenomenon. They start out with the uh, awareness of a particular natural phenomenon, and this drives innovation. When we think about the future of spacecraft, you don't typically imagine that the answer should be found with geckos, right? But the truth is, that's where the future of spacecraft is. It's with geckos. And the reason why is geckos have an adhesive property on their feet that is fantastic, and it's really interesting. And so people who are making glue or adhesives study geckos like crazy to try to figure out how to make better adhesives. Because whether you realize it or not, when you get on an airplane, what's holding it together isn't a bunch of nuts and bolts, it's glue. If that disturbs you a little bit, I'm sorry, it's glue. It's super, 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 super glue, but it's glue. And so when we think about the future of spacecrafts, better adhesives allow things to last longer and be lighter. So studying a natural phenomenon leads to the creative process. This uh, happened this, this last year. We had stuff for the first time ever. My kids experienced this stuff called snow, which we didn't have back in Phoenix. Um, and it's really fun until you have to shovel it, we learned. We're trying to see how, like, what kind of chemical or substance can melt snow the fastest. So my, my son, he was like, I want to find out. What substance will melt the snow the fastest? So after five days of playing in the snow, he went from exploring it to being curious. Now, when he started uh, doing this, we used every single thing imaginable. We did alcohol, we did shaving cream, we did vinegar, we did, I mean, every type of thing. And he found in the end that he thought that salt would melt it the fastest, but it turned out to be alcohol. And so he wanted to see if he could combine rubbing alcohol and water to create a de-icer we could spray on the windshield in the morning. Because if I don't leave at 7.15 in the morning, he misses the before school basketball time that's really important to him uh, before school starts. So um, it's really important that I leave at 7.15. And we went ahead and I started making a de-icer. And as I was doing that, he was looking up things like, should it be warmed or would that break the windshield? So he, from this sense of curiosity, it led him to a place of creativity. And sometimes that's the case as well. Now, is, is that a very original idea to take rubbing alcohol and water and make a de-icer? Absolutely not. But was it original to him? Yes. And that was the key piece there. Sometimes it's awareness of an issue. Kids might care about poverty. They might care about homelessness. They might care about um, how veterans are treated. And for that reason, it leads them to want to design a solution as well. Sometimes it's just geeky interests. Kids love skateboarding, or they love animals, or they love Minecraft. And from there, that's going to generate their creative work. Um, I had a student named Isabel. We used design thinking as our process for uh, student blogging. And Isabel was fascinated by animals. So she wrote, you know, why are we fascinated by butterflies but frightened by moths? And, you know, it took her five minutes to write this pretty long paragraph blog post that she was really into. On the other hand, there was another student. And he was on the spectrum, and he was uh, nonverbal. And he struggled with school. And he also didn't have any friends in class. He was surrounded by people who knew him as the, as the kid with an aide. And I love the fact that this is what happened. He spent a week researching uh, video games and was doing his own video game blog. 
And it took him a full week to write pretty much a paragraph. But then when he posted it, it was really good. And suddenly, a day later, he has 10 comments from classmates. Kids who had never talked to him. Kids who didn't know his name. One kid walked into class and was like, who is that Marco kid that just joined our class? Because his blog post was really good. And he's like, that's me. And it was a powerful moment that reminds me that launching your work to the world is valuable because it changes lives. Sometimes it's a problem that needs to be solved. When I was a kid, some genius person said haircuts are messy. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to combine a vacuum cleaner and a hair trimmer, and they gave us the Floby. And I begged my mom. I was like, Mom, please let us get a Floby. And she said, no, because you'll use it on the dog. And she was right. So I never got one. (laughs) And I bring that up because it doesn't have to be like an earth-shattering problem to be solved. It can be a simple problem that kids need to solve. Sometimes the starting place is a sense of empathy with the audience. One of my favorite moments uh, with this was we had students um, do a Secretary's Day activity. Uh, I ran a service learning program. And so you know, they gave something to the secretary. It was really cool. It worked out well. And then I had a student say, what about the sweepers? What about the people that clean our classrooms? Who's, who's the woman that I see every day that comes in and vacuums the class? And I was so embarrassed because I didn't know her name. I never even bothered to ask. And so I love the fact that the students designed a solution to that. They put together surveys. They asked questions about what the sweepers were into. And they developed gift baskets. We were out painting a mural when the baskets were delivered. And we watched these sweepers walk out of the classroom with tears in their eyes because they had read, both in English and Spanish, the notes the kids had left thanking them for the thankless job that they did on a regular basis. And I was reminded again that sometimes empathy is a great starting place for design. From there, they moved to a place where they ask tons of questions. And this is the idea that they're chasing their curiosity and seeing where it goes. One of the things I believe is that students should question answers as often as they answer questions in school. And one of my favorite examples is a class. uh, Michelle Baldwin teaches a class, and they're mixed grades. It's first through third grade. And her students were asking amazing questions. This blew me away watching the inquiry taking place in her classroom. And I said, what are you doing that's allowing them to ask such great questions? And she said, they're not afraid. She said, sometimes the bravest thing you can do as a teacher, sorry, sometimes the bravest thing you can do as a student is to ask a question. I was talking to a a teacher librarian, and he was using design thinking with uh, students. And in kindergarten, they were asking so many questions that the parent volunteers couldn't uh, write down all the questions. They couldn't keep up with the kids. By the fourth grade, it had dropped to about six questions per kid. And by the eighth grade, the eighth grade group was asking, is this for credit? Am I going to be graded? Is this good enough? Do I have to share it with my classmates? One of the things George Coro says is that, that students should leave school more curious than they came into it. And I agree. More knowledge should make you more curious. I've never seen a cosmologist that's like, you know what? I'm done with asking questions about the universe. I'm finished. No more. I've never seen an engineer who's like, you know what? I really don't care how stuff works. They will look at anything and ask, "How, how does that work? I've never seen an artist who's like, you know what? I'm done looking at art. I'm finished. Or a musician saying, you know what? I don't like music anymore. Learning more should make them more curious. And so that's why it's vital that in this phase, they're engaging in that inquiry. The next phase is where they they engage in research. And uh, 
So we started with look, listen, and learn, and then ask tons of questions. Now they're understanding the process or the problem. And one of the key things is that um, we need a bigger definition of research here. When I look back at that History Day project, research for me meant interviewing experts. It meant watching videos. It meant listening to audio, and it meant reading books. And the internet was brand new at the time. We'd just gotten it at our school. So it meant looking at web pages. And so as we think about the creative and connective uh, elements of technology, this is where we can really leverage it, right? Students, when they engage in research, can interview an expert. One of the things I learned with, when teaching middle school is that um, adults will ignore me if I send them an email. But if a child sends them an email, they'll answer. And so we could do sometimes video conferences on Skype. Sometimes we would do uh, just emails back and forth with an expert, but that was another way to get them to increase that prior knowledge. At that phase, you now move into the end, which is navigate ideas. And so the first piece of it is where they brainstorm. Brainstorming can be fun. You get together and generate a massive list of ideas. Everyone is shouting all over each other. It's exciting. However, this often leads to groupthink, where everyone remains fixated on one particular approach. Often, quieter members never get a chance to share ideas, and the group jumps to a potential solution way too quickly. Here's a different approach that I've tried in my classroom. It's not perfect, and it takes a little bit longer, but it's something that worked for me, so I thought I'd share it. First, students brainstorm alone. Some choose a list, while others choose a web. Next, they meet together as a group. We have one rule in this phase, no judgment. This means no criticism and no commentary. The goal is to reduce fear. This part isn't timed. Sometimes we even brainstorm on multiple days and students borrow ideas from seemingly unrelated fields. Next, we have a member of another group join the brainstorm and add any fresh ideas that they hadn't considered. The original group then meets together yet again and they add ideas to the existing brainstorm while also combining similar ideas. Finally, they will analyze, evaluate, and narrow down their ideas until they have a single coherent concept. This process reduces groupthink while ensuring that everyone's voice is heard. All right, so that's the brainstorming process. The next piece is where they engage in project planning, and I, I call it finding the parts. Um, I want to point out that if you're wondering, you know, why do we have to go through the L, A, and U phase, I think it's significant because there's a key difference between a recipe and a project. And a lot of times I realized that, that my worst projects I had students do were ones where I told them exactly what they were going to make. And in the end, we would end up with 30 identical artifacts. And that's not a project, that's a recipe. That's Hamburger Helper. Um, that's, that, that doesn't work, right? So the goal is that they're actually designing it. They're actually ideating. They're actually coming up with it on their own based upon their own creative impulse. Once they brainstorm, they find the parts. This is the acronym we use for project planning. It stands for product idea. By the way, my, my middle schoolers tried to convince me to change it from product idea to format idea just because it would change the um, acronym right there. Uh, but we did uh, the product idea. So they have a clear picture in their mind of their product. They also have a clear picture of the audience, who the audience is that they're creating it for. Also the role the tasks and the deadlines, and then how, how does this solve a, a problem? So what is the solution? From there, they move into the creative part, and this is where they're creating a prototype. And the word prototype is pretty broad here. So sometimes they make physical products, and that was the case when we did our, our solar projects, for example. And sometimes they make digital products. This was the case of our class online blog, which was Social Voice. And sometimes they make art. And then other times they make a difference. And in these moments, they're doing something like a service learning project. Now, what if you don't have the best materials? Well, the truth is that every roadblock is simply a chance to solve a problem. Sometimes the best choice in technology 
is duct tape and cardboard. You don't have to have high tech to pull off an amazing creative project. Sometimes that limitation fuels your creativity. At that point, once they're there, they then move into a place where they're highlighting what's working and they're fixing what's failing. And I know some people say, don't use the word fail because it's going to cause kids to, to think that their work is no good. But I want to point out something that's a, a pretty significant distinction. Failure is permanent, but failing is temporary. And every creative work is failing at first. Every work. And through iterations, they become better and better. And so if students see failing as a temporary process that you learn from, then they won't view their final creative work as a failure. And there's a difference. Every mistake is another iteration closer and closer to success. Now, you've probably never heard of this Disney movie about the zombie and the alien and the dog. And the reason why is it was a disaster, but it never happened. It was a failing movie. But then when Pixar took over Disney and they said, we're going to embrace the failure process and move toward iterations, they changed this horrible movie into the movie Bolt, which was a decent movie. Similarly, they had this horrible movie about a, a man who opens up a book and then monsters come up and he has to kill monsters from his childhood. Not the happiest Pixar movie ever. But through iterations, that influenced Monsters, Inc. and Inside Out, two great Pixar movies. We're not going to acknowledge Cars 2. It never happened. It was a horrible one. But <laughs> Pixar embraces this idea of moving toward iterations. And the idea is to celebrate risk taking. I used to work with a teacher, Javier. And I love the fact that in Javi's class, he would ask every week, what, as they worked on projects, what was your biggest failure that you faced? Or what's the biggest mistake you made in your project? And then when they shared, they would, they would cheer for these mistakes. And at first, I was like, this is crazy, Javi. Your kids are going to have low standards. They're going to think that it's OK. I was like, oh, you know. And then I watched as their work was getting better and better, because it gave them the permission to improve. One of my favorite examples is a skate park. Now, I don't skateboard because I don't like getting injured. But if you go to a skate park, they celebrate failure, or failing, I should say. They celebrate their mistakes. Skaters all the time take videos of all of their mistakes until they finally have a successful ollie, or whatever the trick is that they're doing. The idea is that I think classrooms should be a little bit more like a skate park a place where mistakes are OK, and they're a part of the learning process. And I think that's where, in design thinking, this highlight and fix phase becomes so significant. One of my favorite examples is a student named Ezekiel. Now, I say failing is temporary and failure is permanent. Well, he had actually failed the eighth grade, truly failed. And we had him on our team. And he was a full uh, quarter behind. He had a quarter's worth of work to make up because he'd already failed the first quarter of seventh grade. He was transferred into our school. And if he didn't make it at the end of this year, he would have dropped out because no high school would have accepted him. He wouldn't have applied. He would have slipped through the cracks. And when we did our. Uh, roller coaster project. That was the first time I ever watched Ezekiel revise his work. And slowly it got better, and it got better, and it got better. And he got super into this project. Well, then he started to slowly revise his blog posts. And then he slowly revised his math problems. And he squeaked by with C's. And then he moved up to B's and started making up the rest of his work. He became the first kid in uh, his family to uh, finish the eighth grade. And that was a celebration. He became the first kid in his family to graduate high school 
and not be in jail. And I would argue it's because not just in middle school, but in high school, he had teachers who knew how, how to help him embrace this revision process. We hear the word grit all the time, right? But the truth is, if we want grit, we have to give slack. We have to allow for mistakes. Just saying, I'm going to hold you to higher standards isn't enough. We need to provide spaces where people can revise their work and improve. In the final phase, it's ready to launch. This is when they're sending their work to the world. One of the, the best moments in US history in terms of television was unscripted. It was when we went to the moon. I say we, I wasn't a part of it at all. It's when the United States went to, to the moon. I wasn't alive yet. So the US went to the moon. And people, because they watched the launch, they were inspired. It inspired a generation of engineers, of scientists, but also of artists, novelists, anyone who wanted to move past the boundaries of what people previously had thought was possible. And because of this process, they were inspired to do creative work themselves. Now, the truth is, the Apollo missions could have been private. They could have gone to the moon. They could have written it up in a journal article, and that could have been it. But because they shared their, their final launch to the world, it inspired more people as a result. I'm going to give a, a small example. Um, when I was a kid, I used to love Bob Ross. You guys remember Bob Ross? Yeah, happy little trees, no mistakes, just happy accidents, right? Um, Bob Ross. Now, Bob Ross was not the greatest ever painter. I get it. There are better painters out there. However, because I watched Bob Ross on a regular basis on PBS, I wanted to paint. Watching someone paint, sharing their journey made me want to paint. And that's the power of a launch. When you launch, you're also saying, I'm not afraid to be known. Too often, student work ends up in an audience of the kitchen. It ends up on the refrigerator. And yet, I love this example. Someone placed eyeglasses on a museum floor as a prank. And within minutes, it was a work of art. <laughs> I guarantee that the work your students are doing in the classroom is better than hipster glasses on a museum floor. I guarantee it. And so it's not only important to share your finished work, it's important to share your journey with the world as well. Austin Kleon says, become a documentarian of what you do. And I love this idea. We had the, this happen. We, we led the Global Day of Design. And I love the fact that for a full day, students engaged in the design thinking process. Our first year, we had 40,000. Second year, we had around 60,000. This last year, we had over 100,000 students. And I love the fact that they were sharing their work with the world. They were showing it to everybody, letting them see what they had designed, sharing their journey. And other kids who saw it on Twitter, saw it on Snapchat, saw it on Facebook, they became inspired themselves to engage in this process. That's the power of launching your work to the world. That's why that piece matters. Now, quick question. What about time constraints? What about the curriculum map? What about the test? All right, we feel these pressures as teachers. What if I don't have the best technology? My friend Trevor Muir in Grand Rapids, his students um, had laptops, but they, they weren't even one to one. And they had to teach uh, World War II in uh, three weeks, which is a really short time to learn about World War II. And so his students went through the design thinking process, and they filmed a documentary. Now, what I love about the way they filmed their documentary is they filmed it on their cell phones. They invited people from nursing homes into their um, school. They interviewed soldiers. They created many documentaries and a longer documentary. And then at the very end, well, I'm going to tell you about that in a second. I just want to point this out. 
time constraints. They had three weeks to get it done. Curriculum map, they had to follow the same standards, hit all the same standards, and, and they did. The test, in the very end, when the, after they had released this documentary, they took the district benchmark test and they had the highest scores in the district. And so, as we think about it, you know, best technology, they were using their cell phones. But what I love about it is the very, very end of that story was the launch. When they were finished with the documentary, the students decided that they wanted to have a real premiere of their video. They called every single uh, carpet place they could get to to get red carpet. And then they to get it donated, and they did. They got red carpet donated. It turns out it's easier than you think because nobody really wants red carpet right now. <laughs> <laughs> and they also called every single movie theater until they could get a movie theater to donate a screen. And then one of the uh, soldier's daughters worked for a TV news station, and so the news ended up showing up. They had a red carpet event where these former World War II soldiers walked down the red carpet to see the documentary about their stories. They were greeted to, to cheers. The families showed up, the kids showed up, the kids' families showed up, and then the community showed up, and they had to run it on two screens. But the most powerful piece of that story was the very, very end of it. That summer, one of the soldiers passed away. And that soldier's daughter came to uh, Trevor's student and said, hey, can we use that interview you did with my dad in his memorial service? And he said, yeah. And then this, this woman said, my dad never talked about the war. He never told me what he went through, but he also never told me that my mom is why he kept going when he felt hopeless. I never knew that they loved each other so much. I never knew how they fell in love. I never knew any of that. And that would have been gone if you hadn't captured that. And to me, that's a reminder of the power of a launch, is that you never know who your work is going to impact. And the other powerful piece is that I guarantee you that project changed that student's life forever. And so Trevor starting a project with his classmate, or his, his students, had no idea the sheer impact that that project would have on their life. And that's why the bottom line is this. The launch process is a great way to do design thinking. But the most powerful creative force in your classroom is the teacher. Because you're the one that will build a relationship that will inspire kids to become makers. So if you're in the classroom right now, I just want to say thank you for the creative work you're doing on a regular basis.